Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Armor Report. This is our week in review. We're rebranding it, cracking, cracking Foxy with the Armor Report. All right, I'm Brett Rosenthal. We're going to talk about a couple of different things today. Cracking Foxy, to me, is just a real quick discussion about something I've seen this week that cannot be ignored. And today we're going to talk about Kathy Wood and have a little bit of fun. Then we're going to go into um, an armor education piece where we're going to talk about the seven steps that we take when deciding what stocks we think we're going to want to buy, right? So we build our whiteboard. How do we build that whiteboard? How do we know what stocks to buy? These are the seven fundamental steps we take to determine whether or not a stock can make it to that list. And we're answering a question from one of you, our Armor Insiders, who happens to watch this video and been on this show for probably three uh, three years now. I'm talking to you, Deb. So you asked this question, and I'm going to answer it. Anybody who's got a question that you'd like for me to address, feel free to drop it into the comment section after this show is over. I'll look at all of them, determine which one I think I can add value with, and then perhaps uh, share it the following week. <clears throat> so feel free to do that. <clears throat> Please don't forget, before we dive in, and then, of course, after we talk about those seven steps, I'll give you some thoughts on how to make money in the stock market next week, what our positions are. We've added two new positions to the portfolio. So those of you following the Armour Report, we were max cash going into last week, and we've added two positions to the portfolio. I'll share those two with you later in the show. And then, of course, we'll get to Q&A as we always do. I love the Q&A section. So guys, fill up the comment section as we go. And then I'll just rifle through all the questions at the end. And we're going to get to all of them. It's really where I find a lot of um, quality thoughts come to light that make me think and help me be a better investor. So I appreciate the effort you guys make by dropping in comments. If you're watching this in a replay, then drop the comments in the bottom here. Um, ask questions, and I'll answer those questions as well, um, and when I can, as soon as I can. Um, so this is a virtual hedge fund experience. You're part of a virtual hedge fund. Armor Insiders are on our trading desk every day, and it looks pretty much like this right here. Okay, So you're on a virtual hedge fund trading desk. You're sitting at computers like this on a big, broad table like that, and we're all sharing information together. OK, we're following a strategy that we like to call the armor investing way. And it looks like this three essential stages, fundamental research. That's what we're going to talk about today. The seven steps we take. The fundamental steps that we take to to determine if we want to even buy the stock. Right. Then we use algorithms to figure out when to buy the stock and we use risk management rules to protect ourselves from ourselves. OK, so. Don't forget what I'm sharing with you is my own personal experience. If you're new to this show, I'm Brett Rosenthal. I've been managing money for over 30 years. I ran hedge funds for a decade. Um, and I'm sharing with you the processes that have made uh, myself successful over the years. And it's a never ending process. So when I call it the virtual hedge fund desk, we're constantly building the approach. If you stop, um, perfecting and working, then you die. It's like a shark. If it doesn't keep swimming. It's dead. So we're constantly working here at our desk to get better, to improve. And I'll share with you successes and failures, and we'll all improve together. So that's the point. So without further ado, Bob gonna... gets bumped off, upset me, and then you birds crack and foxy, but it's all right now, now that I know what it's all about. So those of you who know the Maltese Falcon know that quote. Crack and Foxy with the armor report, talking about Kathy Wood, looking at this stock right here. Okay. The transparency ETF. The transparency ETF. Okay. Let's talk about this for a second. It's been around for eight months. It's closing its doors. It only raised $13 million. It was a Kathy Wood idea. And let me just put this up on the, so you can read it. Okay. Focusing, here it is, focusing on stocks that offer the greatest openness, communication, and trust. What? 
that's a reason to invest. Openness, communication, and trust. It's so wonderfully altruistic. What a wonderful idea, right? $13 million peaked on the first day, went straight down, and it's closing its doors. And what I submit to you today is we are witnessing the wonderful beginning of the pendulum swing, which is right now all the way at the absurd. And it's beginning its slow, steady move back to normal, probably all the way to conservative. That's, that's where it's headed. Mark my words, it started right here with this announcement. Anybody who thinks that they can invest in stocks because of openness and trustworthy and communication is deluding themselves. And I think it's a wonderful thing that only $13 million showed up for that fund. Now I'm going to take a more cynical view of this particular fund. Take a look at the top five, four or five stocks. Those are the top four or five stocks that were in the fund. Teladoc, Netflix, Shop, and Spotify. I submit to you, if it wasn't altruism, okay, I submit to you, you're going to find those same five stocks in ARK Innovator funds, in all different Kathy Wood funds. So if you're cynical, you think to yourself, boy, that's an interesting way to start a new fund to attract new capital to support the stocks that are in your other funds that are suffering. But we're going to go with altruism today. We're going to pretend that investing has to do with trust and openness, right? I'll tell you what, the Armour Report is going to start an ETF. We're going to invest in butterflies, rainbows, and unicorns. How about that? That sounds nice. Let's all do it. Okay, <laughs> moving on. I think I've gotten past the crack and foxy face. I just couldn't help it. I saw that story and it was so ridiculous to me. I had to share it with you. All right. Getting on to something more important. Let's move on to this question that Deb has asked us and that we're going to answer now. How to make money in stocks, right? What stocks to buy next week? How do you figure that out? These are the seven steps that we take to determine when to buy, to, not when, but what stocks to buy, what stocks to put on our whiteboard. Here we go. Um, let me see if I can share this with you. Because what I'm going to do here is I'm going to share with you this screen right here. Okay. And I'm going to make you a downloadable copy of this with all of our processes. So that if you'd like to, I'm going to close this for now. Okay. So it didn't look the way I want. But if you'd like to get a downloadable copy of these seven steps, then go ahead and Twitter, go on to Twitter and DM me, right? And then I'll send you um, the PDF file so that you can have it for yourself and you can start building your own processes. All right. Um, let's start with, and you, you know, you can grab a pen and a piece of paper and write these things down. Let's start with the first thing that we do when it comes to investigating or doing fundamental research on a company. The first thing I look for, I don't know if I want to say first, because all seven of these are important. And so I get to them as I get to them when I'm, in, when I'm looking at a company. But the first thing I want to do is share with you a screen of the William O'Neill Market Smith. Full disclosure, I don't get paid by Market Smith or William O'Neill. I use these products. I'm just sharing this with you. I've been, you know, a follower of the William O'Neill style of investing since I got in the business. How to Make Money in Stocks is a great book to read to get started if you're new at this game and you want to learn a, a foundation. Okay. So I like to believe that I've taken that as a guide 
and enhanced it for the world we live in today. And I say that in all humility. Okay. So some of these things you're going to recognize, but I'm going to look at a chart of market Smith. So you guys can see, and let's pull up, um, let's pull up, um, a desk for the fun of it, just for the fun of it. All right. You could pull up any stock you want, but this is a chart of market Smith. IBD.com is a good source. You don't have to pay for market Smith. There's other ways to find out this information, but I'm using this chart. I've been looking at these charts literally for 35 years in one form or another. And when I started looking at them, believe it or not, they were paper versions. There was no such thing as a computer like this, but right down here are the quarterly numbers, the last four quarters. You can see right here a 50 and a 43. It means the earnings had a 50% increase over a year ago, revenue 43%. Okay. So the first thing I do is I just go look at the quarterly numbers to see if there's an acceleration in the quarterly numbers, revenue and earnings. That's step one. These are things that bring institutions into a stock. Okay. So what we want to see is acceleration in revenue and earnings. That's an easy thing you can look at. That's step one. Step two, I go to the balance sheet. Now, before I get off revenue and earnings, there are some stocks that are on my whiteboard that have a revenue and earnings in the last quarter that don't look very good. Okay. We're going to get to that when we go over number seven on this list. Okay. Just because an idea doesn't have the revenue and earnings momentum that I want doesn't mean I don't put it on the whiteboard. I'm going to explain in a minute. I'm going to give you an example of a stock that's on the whiteboard when we get to number seven. And I'm going to tell you why it's there. Okay. And why we're overriding the quarterly revenue and earnings declines. Okay. So sometimes you have to do that. That's why there's seven steps to follow. All right. But the first thing to do is I like to go through looking at the quarterly earnings and revenue, see if it's accelerating. That gets me interested. I'm a growth stock investor. That's what I want to see. All right. Then I go to the balance sheet and uh, the income statement, you know, looking for, and you can, you can find some of these things over here. Um, you could pull up the weekly version. Okay. And you get all this data block over here of information. So what I'm looking for there are different pieces of information you find in the financials, like margins. I like to see margin expansion. Okay. I like to look for days sales outstanding, DSOs, they call it. I like to look at the debt situation, right? All, all these types of things. Um, I'll give you some examples of what I mean and why this is important. When I first got, even before I got into the business, working with my dad, my dad's been doing this since birth, right? And I learned a lot at his knee. He was my mentor. I worked with him for a number of years in New York. We were running the largest equity business in the country for some big um, uh, wire houses, um, working with high net worth individuals. So, you know, one of the first things my dad ever taught me was when I was in college, he said to me, Dad, he said, son, you need to be an accounting major. I said, God, Dad, I don't want to be an accounting major. I'm having too much fun in college. Okay. I'll be a finance major, you know. Total waste of your time, son. Finance major will be a waste of your time. You need to be an accounting major because accounting is the language of business. Okay. So I took some accounting courses, of course, and I learned the basics of the language. But my dad's told me a lot of things over the years. And I got to tell you, that's at the top of the list of being accurate. There is nothing I learned in my finance courses at college right, that have done anything for me in the real world. But everything I learned in accounting has been helpful. So it helps you understand margins. It helps you understand. I'll give you an example of days sales outstanding, DSOs. I'm just giving you one example here. If you say to me, I don't know anything about accounting, there are some basic accounting books you can get so you know some of the key things to look for. But again, we're going to get to number seven on this list. 
and it's going to help you in this area. Okay. So don't worry if you're new to this and you don't have any accounting background, don't worry. Okay. But when it comes to DSOs as an example, okay, this is why accounting is important. Let's say there's a company that has an average day's sales outstanding of 60. In other words, they put inventory into the market. They get paid back within 60 days on average. And so this company shows expanding revenue and earnings, which is the first thing I look for. That looks great. And then they have a huge quarter. Wow. The numbers look phenomenal. And the stock is down big on the earnings announcement. And you're wondering why. I don't get it. They just have blowout numbers. How could the stock be down? Sometimes it's the DSOs. They had a huge quarter, but their day sales outstanding went from 60 to 90, maybe 120. So what that tells the analyst, the fundamental analyst, is that they're stuffing the channel with product and it's not moving. And that probably means in the future, they're going to start to have write-offs, okay, for inventory that gets sent back to them, product that doesn't get sold. Now, I haven't done the analysis, but as an example, you saw what happened to um, um, STX. I don't know if you saw what happened to um, Seagate. And I'm not saying it was day sales outstanding exactly, but if you look at Seagate, the company announced earnings and one of the problems with earnings and the stock got whacked is that the company is out there dealing with an inventory problem, right? There's too much inventory out there and their customers are drawing down inventory. So they're not buying any more product. And so what you'll see, in fact, let's look at the numbers and you'll probably see this coming through back. So here's the bad number, right? So here's some red numbers, quarterly, you know, revenue decline, earnings decline. Right. But if you look a couple quarters ago, oh, revenues were skyrocketing. Earnings were skyrocketing. Right. And so to a certain extent, the semiconductor companies were stuffing the channel. Now we go through a recession and the end customer is working down inventories. So there's just an example of why understanding basic uh, uh, accounting type of rules that are important can help you understand what you're looking at when you're looking at quarterly earnings and revenues. So you got to kind of look at both things and that's what I do. All right. So what's the next thing we can look at on this chart? Um, what I would do is I would click on right up here is the um, hyperlink to the company's website. And so the next thing that's really important to me is the management team of the company. Okay. So the third thing on the list, and I'm just looking at my list, make sure I get it right. All right. The third thing on the list, is the management team of the company. What I'm looking for, it's not that I won't invest in the company if it's a you know new CEO, never done this before. But what if I look back over my life at the biggest successes I've ever had, it's because I've tapped into the right people. This is something a lot of, a lot of investors kind of miss here, but investing is more about people than it is about products. I could show you you know, hundreds of products that were just the greatest widgets on earth that have gone the way of the dodo because the person running the company was a dodo. Okay. That's the problem. You know, when I was working in Manhattan for about 14 years, and again, this is before, you know, this is in the nineties, right? Leading up to 2000. But during that period, and certainly going back decades before, when my dad was in the business in the early 60s, the only way to really um, um, gather information from a management team is to sit down with them, okay? So we, we carried a big cudgel because of the assets we were managing. I mean, we were controlling more than 300 million at the time. And so we were able to get on the phone, talk to management teams. And the thing about New York City at the time is that any company worth its salt, the management team would come through Manhattan at least once a year and, and many times, four times a year, once a quarter. And so what they would do is go to different money managers, fund managers, um, and sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Could last for an hour, could last for three hours, depending on you know how deep you got into the situation. So what we used to do, we had this conference room, and we would literally meet with, I would say, four 
management teams a week. That is not an exaggeration. Almost once a, a day, well, once a week. I mean, four out of five times of the week, we would have a management team come through, sit down, give us their pitch, explain why we should invest in the company. Now, in today's world, what's beautiful about the internet is you don't have to do that, right? I live in Palm Beach now. I live in Jupiter. I can get on, I can get on the internet and I can watch any um, analyst meeting I want. I mean, they're all over the place. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay, that's another step here in the process. But after sitting through meeting after meeting after meeting, and sometimes I'd ask my dad, why are we meeting with this company? We got no interest in this business. He would say two things to me. Number one, we're doing it for the repetition. The more management teams you meet, the more people you sit across the table with, <clears throat> the better you get at judging people. And investing is about people. It's not just about product. So I learned that early. So repeated management. And one day, don't, you know what? Remind me at some point. It's a long story. So I'll tell you at some other time. But I sat across the table from a chief executive officer. Um, it, it was a fascinating display of, um, of a lie. I mean, it was just an unbelievable lie. This person ended up in prison. Okay, about a year later, um, coming out of that meeting, my dad and I looked at each other and said, we have to short this stock like crazy. This, this guy's crazy, right? And we ended up owning a lot of puts, made a lot of money on that call. I'll tell you about that in the future. It's a fascinating story. You won't believe it. But let's stay on topic here, okay? So you want to find the right management team. Here's an example of what I mean. My favorite thing to do is to follow a turnaround artist. So I'm going to tell you right now, an example of a turnaround artist that made us a lot of money and an idea we're looking at right now that's on the whiteboard. All right. So if you've found this conversation so far helpful, hit that like button, share this video with your friends. Okay. And if you have any questions for me after this conversation, boom, put a comment down in the bottom here. All right. So. Back in the 1990s, met with a management team of a company called Novell. Now, Novell was a basic software company, nothing too exciting about it. The company's not public anymore. It's a $3 stock. Um, I'm having a brain freeze right now. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, that was quick. All right. So um, the CEO of the company who was just hired into Novell was a guy named Eric Schmidt. Now, you might be familiar with this name, but back in the 1990s, no one really knew him. We looked into his background and he was a bit of a turnaround artist. <clears throat> he would come into companies, basically in the software business, turn them around, usually sell them to some bigger company at the end. So we, we liked his track record. We bought Novell at around $6 a share. Company got taken over around 26 bucks. That was a great trade. The next company he went to was a little known company at the time called Google. Okay. So if you simply followed Eric Schmidt, you could make a lot of money. This is what I mean when I say people over product is more important. He was so good at turning companies around. He made a fortune at Novell. And then Sergey Brin realized, you know what? Um, we're a public company. We've done what we could do. We need to bring someone in here who's a great manager. And we're going to hire Eric Schmidt. And the rest is, you know, history. Google is one of the greatest stocks of all time. That's an example of investing in the right people. So here's a stock that's on my whiteboard right now. You're not going to believe it, okay? You're not going to believe it. But I'm starting to do some serious work on Pinterest. The stock's been crushed. I know the story. We all know the story. It's totally done. It's toast. And yet there's a new chief executive officer right here. It just got hired. I'll leave it to you to do some research. Find out who this guy is and whether or not you think 
you might want to be a part of his future. We're still doing the work. Okay? It's on our whiteboard. Armor Insiders, we're going to listen to the conference calls when he was brought into the company. No doubt he's already had a call. I will look for really the first quarterly earnings announcement since his tenure has begun before I buy the stock. Typically, when a new CEO comes in in a disastrous situation like this, the first quarter of announcement under him, under this new guy, is a disaster. He writes off everything, the kitchen sink and everything. And the stock can bottom on that. And if his vision is right, okay? Think Satyam Nadella when he took over CEO of Microsoft. You had a stock that was doing nothing for a decade. And then the right guy took over the position and it's been an unbelievable winner. That's why management teams are important. That's the, that's the third thing that we look at, okay? Number four. Number four, I'd like to find something new going on inside the company. So something new can be a new CEO. It could be a new product that's, you know, taking the world by storm. It can be a new process. I'll give you an example. For a while there, you could literally invest. This happened over the last five years. You could literally invest in every company that was switching its process from a, a boxing up of a software product and shipping it and switching that process to software as a service. Getting back to Microsoft, what made Microsoft so huge? When Nadella took over, one of their biggest changes was going from the, you know, basically you would buy a CD and pop it into your computer and download Windows or Word or, or, or you know PowerPoint or whatever. And they went to Windows 365, software as a service. That's one example. I know there's other things going on at Microsoft. But the change to a SaaS-based model made huge stocks out of all kinds of companies that you would have thought are just kind of, you know, big cap names that are kind of rumbling along. How about Adobe? When Adobe went to SaaS-based model, you know, I can list, I don't know, tens of them, maybe even hundreds of them. Big cap companies that seem to have a normal growth trajectory that were pretty boring, changed their process to SaaS, stocks went through the roof. So number four is something new inside the company, new product, new management, new process. Okay. Number five, we like to look for industry group macro um, changes that make the stock, the individual company more powerful. As an example, um, I think the future of warfare is drone technology. So that's a macro idea about drones. So what we want to now go look for, just as an example, I'll throw up here. We're going to look at a company like Elbit, for instance. Okay. So Elbit is probably the number one drone company in the world, in my personal opinion. It's an Israeli company. Okay. Stock looks phenomenal in a bear market. Stock looks phenomenal in a bear market. And if you'll look here, look at the earnings number. Not that attractive. These are red numbers. Red numbers on the earnings front. Stock's doing really, really well. Okay. One reason for that is that they're at the forefront of drone technology and that macro event of drones becoming the future of warfare is being, um, is attracting institutional uh, uh, interest. Okay. Another example of that would be AVAV. Okay. And I'm going to get to a minute. I'm going to get to a minute. If you look at the terrible numbers here on AVAV, you would think, why would I have any interest in this company? I'm going to get to that in a minute. When we get to number seven on this list, I'm going to share with you why this stock is on my whiteboard. Okay. Um, so again, if you find this conversation helpful, if you find it valuable, hit the like button for me. That would be great. That alerts other individuals who need this information, that this video is there for them. So help them out. Okay. Um, so what was that number? That was number five, right? So there's a macro event that we like. Could be drone technology, could be cannabis stocks. Okay. 
there's a macro story there on cannabis. At some point, that lottery ticket's going to pay off. Do we take advantage of that macro story and how do we do it? Right. So then we start looking for stocks that we can put on our whiteboard. All right. Um, number six is institutional sponsorship. Now, there's many different ways to do this, but William O'Neill and the Market Smith Service really helps out in this process. You can, if you, I'll show you what I mean. You could take a look here um, and over here it will show you, if you were to click on owners and funds, it'll show you how much is owned by institutions, 58% in this case, okay? And the type of funds, you can click on show fund ownership and get all this information, okay? The idea here is if you look at a stock, if you think you found the greatest idea since sliced bread and you look and see that there's not a single fund that owns it or the funds that own it, are there aren't many and they're not A-rated funds. I mean, they're just kind of small, out of the way funds. Then it's not wrong. You might, you're, you're not wrong. You could be onto something, but you're so early that you, you might want to monitor this. And when you start to see funds come in, you know that the money's flowing and now maybe it's time to elevate it on your whiteboard from the bottom of the board to the top of the board. So it's not that I won't have a name on my board because of the funds, but I watch the fund flows. Conversely, if 80% of the stock is owned by funds, who's left to put the stock up? It just becomes a market stock. So that doesn't seem real sexy to me either. So there's this sweet spot of funds beginning to put capital to work, right? But not too much capital to work. So we have a saying here on our desk that information makes money and institutions make markets. And this is an example of that. Understanding what institutions are doing and being there in front of them, but not so far in front that the race hadn't even started yet is the key. And now I'm going to wrap up this thought before I get to how to make money in stocks next week, which I know we're all waiting for that. We'll talk about we can review some of the things we did last week. I'm going to share with you the two positions we bought last week as new investments in the armor report and then how we're going to trade them next week. Um, so I'll express that in a second. But number seven on the list of the seven steps we take to determine what stocks to buy, what stocks to put on our watch list, okay? Number seven is listening to the conference call of earnings. Now this gets back to my conversation where I used to literally sit down with probably at least four, sometimes five different companies a week, okay? That's a lot of companies, a lot of quote, conference calls. Back then, there weren't conference calls on the internet. So you had to sit down with the management team and have them walk you through the earnings numbers. But you can do it now. I could do it now just sitting at my desk right here. Every company has an earnings conference call. And the beauty for somebody like yourself, who hasn't been doing this for 30 plus years, is that you can listen. And if you want to fast forward to the analyst questions. Now, I, I wouldn't fast forward. Because I think that, and I can attest to this because I learned this way, the more time you listen to a management team, the longer you do it, you'll start to hear strength and weakness in, um, in the voice, okay? It's a real thing. And it will help you understand what's going on inside the company. Sometimes you can just hear it. The CEO's got the bit in his teeth. You know, go listen to the last earnings announcement if you want to hear what I'm talking about of Trade Desk. This is back in May, symbols TTD. Go listen to that earnings announcement. That is a prime example of a chief executive officer in his opening comments who, who is clearly conveying to you the, the enormity of his opportunity. Now, it doesn't mean he hasn't stumbled. I mean, Snap imploded and, you know, stock was down 7% trade desk on Friday. And people think, you know, probably August 8th, it'll be a terrible earnings announcement for trade desk. I think differently. Go listen to that conference call. That's your homework. Okay. But you can always fast forward to the Q&A 
from analysts because they're going to ask these key questions. Remember I was talking about days sales outstanding. There's an analyst that's going to say, Hey man, you have blowout numbers, but your DSOs doubled what's going on. And you'll start to learn the terminology and you'll understand the business. The reason this is so important and let's just get to this last example. And then I'll start, you know, we'll talk about what happened last week and how we're going to invest next week. So AeroVironment is on the, uh, our whiteboard. It's on the top of our whiteboard. There are a couple of issues with the company. So here are the seven steps we take. And yet the last quarterly earnings and revenue number doesn't look very good. Right. And if you listen to the management of the company, <clears throat> no offense, I don't mean any offense to the management of the company, but they're not um, um, they're not the type of uh, management team I'd want to get behind. But that's OK. They're early in the process. I would be all over the stock if there was an announcement tomorrow that a new CEO is taken over and he's coming from Lockheed Martin. You, you follow me? Or he's coming from Northrop Grumman. Right. This is the chief operating officer, of Northrop Grumman. And now he's joined AeroVironment as the CEO. What that tells you is this guy just left a cushy job at a huge company with a great pension, right? And he's gone to a startup. Basically, that's what this company is because he sees the massive growth potential. That has not happened yet at AeroVironment. It may not. I'm just telling you, if you saw that news story, you would know the Arm Report be buying that stock with two hands. Okay. Right now it's on our whiteboard. Why is it on the whiteboard with earnings down 71% last quarter and sales down 2%? Because when I was on that conference call, by the way, margins were down and inventories were up. That seems like it's completely opposite what I just told you about those other rules that we follow. This is why they listening to the conference call is so important and understanding a macro picture. Okay, so we use all of these together. If you listen to the call, there is such an insatiable demand for drone technology. If you understand military contracting, you'll understand that a company can't land huge deals with the DOD and those types of entities without having the inventory to deliver. So the company on the last call told everybody, we are ramping up inventory like crazy. This is hitting margins right now, but it's going to allow us the back half of this year to have some big numbers. Now you could say you don't believe the CEO, that's your decision, but I like the macro story. I think drones are the future of warfare. I, I understand the process when it comes to working with major governments and militaries. You can't get a big deal if you can't prove to them you can deliver on the deal. So you got to build inventory. So this is one example where the stock stays on my whiteboard just because inventory is going up. Day sales outstanding in this case doesn't matter to me because there's a paradigmatic shift in the macro story. So those are the ideas of how I put something onto my whiteboard, how I know what stocks to watch, what stocks to buy. Those are the seven. If you want that list, go to Twitter, DM me on Twitter, and I'll send you that, um, um, that PDF file so you can have it for yourself and you can start building your own rules. Okay. So I hope you found that helpful. If you do hit the like button, I appreciate it. It'll help others who need this valuable, I think, valuable information. It's taken me years to figure it out, um, and I'm happy to share it with you. Now let's jump into um, a review of the market and what we'll be doing this week. All right, so first two things. I'm going to do this as fast as possible, and then I'll get to your questions. So let's just, let's just fire it off real quick. This is the S&P chart right here. The risk monitor is still red. We're not putting capital to work. Okay. The market has had a rally between these key levels that I've been sharing with you the last couple of weeks. These yellow dashed lines are the Fed announcement days of May and June. Okay. I think that the market will stay in this range until we get to the July announcement. Now it's possible if the July announcement 
ends up being dovish, as in we're raising 100 basis points and then we're not going to do anything for the rest of the year and we're going to suspend quantitative tightening to see what's happening with the economy because we're afraid of a recession. I'm just making this up, but let's just pretend that was the comment, right? Market could skyrocket above the May Fed meeting breakdown, okay? Because it'll start pricing in a more accommodative Fed. The flip side is the Fed comes out and says, hey, we told you we don't care if there's a recession. We are stepping on the neck of inflation. We're raising 75 basis points now, and we're going to do another couple raises, the next couple quarter, blah, blah, blah. And the market craters below the June um, the June line that you're looking at here. Okay. So what happened last week is a bounce off of the bottom to test the 50 day moving average. And it's, it's nothing that's going to get us long at the armor report. Now there are two assets that we added to the armor portfolio. So just to put this in perspective, conservative balanced, aggressive portfolios were max cash going into the week. We now have anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of our capital committed depending on how aggressive we want to be in the following two assets we bought shares of treasuries long dated treasury bonds 20 plus year treasury bonds and we bought our first allocation in precious metals again by getting long sprot physical gold. Now, let me explain to you my thesis in a nutshell. I'll make it quick and then I'll get to your Q&A. Thesis. The market is going to begin pricing in a recession and stagflation. The two assets that will go up in that environment will be 30 year or 20 plus year government paper, US government paper and gold. After the sell off in equities, because the earnings announcements are going to be God awful. We just saw that in Snap. We saw that in Seagate. We're going to see that in a bunch of other stocks and companies over the next couple of weeks. Earnings season is not going to be pleasant. There's a litany of big cap companies announcing the reduction of the workforce. Apple, Amazon, Tesla, the list goes on. Microsoft. Some point out there in the future, we're going to start to get some terrible employment numbers. This is going to put the Fed in a box. Are they going to keep stepping on the neck of inflation when we get terrible employment numbers? I don't know. But two assets that I expect to go up in that environment are long dated U.S. government bonds and gold. Those will be the first assets to start to move pricing in stagflation or a recession, but the Fed starting to ease. Okay. The Fed easing, we've had an unbelievable rocket rise in the U.S. dollar. Okay. Take a look at U.S. dollar versus other currencies. Okay. Just an unbelievable rocket ride, which has suppressed the price of gold. Okay. If we get any indication that the fed is going to begin to slow down that process, precious metals, long dated U S government bonds. Um, the ECB raised interest rates for the first time in a decade. Just to remind you the last time that this is last week, the last time they did that, we had a crisis in sovereign debt. People are going to hide in U.S. government bonds. So the theory here is to put capital in these assets, see if we can make some money on them. After the equity wipeout, then we start building positions in growth stocks. That's the macro premise. You know, I say this is a virtual hedge fund. If you put us in a category, our virtual hedge fund is a macro fund. That's what we do. Okay. So those are the two investments I was willing to put into the portfolio. Let me just share with you real quick. We are absolutely crushing it on the day trading desk. So for those of you unaware, you know, at our macro virtual hedge fund, we're making investments, we're swing trading and we're day trading in a market where we have maximum cash 
in portfolios, our biggest focus is on day trading. Armor Insiders, we've got on the website for you, the Armor Day Trading Playbook. I update it every week now. You can go in there and see the day trades. The theory behind the playbook is that it's just, it's like football, okay? There are just so many plays you can call in a football game, right? It's the off tackle. It's a quarterback draw. You know, it's, it's a post pattern. There's just so many patterns. The faster we can identify what the pattern is, the faster we can make money. You know, sure, you're going to tell me there's some trick plays in the playbook. I don't care about those plays. I'm looking for the high probability plays where rewards worth the risk. When we see them, we act. Here's an example of what we did on Friday um, in, in treasuries. Okay. Actually, um, it was, it was Thursday in treasuries. So this was just one of our favorite trades. This is in the armor playbook. We look for this trade over and over and over again, because it's got a high probability of success and it makes us a lot of money. This yellow line is the armor move and average. This is a three minute bar chart. Every bar is three minutes. The asset gapped above the armor move and average. This is called a gap and go play. Right. This is like a this is like a post pattern into the end zone. This is a gap and go play. It gaps up. It challenges the VWAP, which are the black dots. We get long on the bar that takes out the high of the challenge bar, this red bar. So we get long on that green bar. It rips right to the average true range high of the day. We booked a profit on half the position. There was the inevitable sell off to test the VWAP. We put the half position back on cheaper. It rallied to the close and we held it overnight as an investment so that we were able to capture the big gap up on Friday. And now you can see why on the daily chart, we think long-term treasuries are making a reverse head and shoulders bottom. If they can break out above 120, we're going to be proven right. And we think there's a lot of money we can make in here. As always, we use risk management rules to protect ourselves. So if we're wrong, raise our stop to break even at this point. We bought it right using day trading rules. Now we're on to a swing trade or a longer term investment. And we have stops to protect ourselves. Worst case scenario, this is a break even investment now. Emotions out of it. We see if it can run. Okay. Precious metals real quick. And then I'll get to your questions. because This is a long, long discussion today. And I appreciate you spending time with me. But Deb, that was a big question you had going over those seven, seven topics. Um, seven rules to, to uh, putting a fundamental rules of how to put a stock on the whiteboard. Um, so precious metals, why would I buy it down here? Totally insane. It's got nothing to do with an armor algorithm. It has to do with a macro opinion of what's going on in the world and that I want to own some gold. So I'm looking at gold to come down to the bottom of this channel that goes back to 2020. I think it's going to hold like it did back here in 20, what is this, 2021? Uh, Okay. And so the first thing I look for is a candlestick reversal pattern right at the support. And that's what those two bars right here are. So I put a position on. I've put on a third to a half of the exposure I want. Only a third to a half, maybe a third to a quarter, really. In other words, I could triple or quadruple the position size on the asset if this turns out to be the entry point. So it's just a toe dipping. And now let's get to your questions. If you enjoyed this conversation, you thought it was helpful, hit the like button. Any comments or questions you have about stocks and you're watching this in replay, put them in the comment section. I'll answer them throughout the week and then we can get to our next week and review next week. So for right now, let's go to your um, live you know, message board and I'm going to start reading off your questions and we'll see what you guys want to talk about. Uh, thanks for spending the time. All right, Stephen Kreisberg, nice to see you again, brother. Last couple of weeks, total pleasure um, having you join us on the desk again. I hope you're well. What do you got for me? Brett, what do you think about SKX? All right, SKX. Well, at the moment, I don't think much because it's not showing. There it is. <laughs> oh, Skechers. All right. Um, well, let's take a quick look here at our fundamentals, right? SKX. Now that we've gone over this discussion, 
What does it look like to you? So some decent earnings growth, although maybe slowing a bit, but revenue growth looks pretty good. Nothing wrong there. All right. I'd have to go dive in to get more detail about it. I know nothing about the company. And so my question to you is, and you don't you don't have to answer this right now, but maybe later in the comment section, tell me why you want to own Skechers. Like what's the thesis? Is there something new going on at Skechers that I don't know about? Okay, is there a new management, a new process, a new sneaker you think is going to be great? What's getting you interested in Skechers? That's why I'm sharing with you these seven steps to fundamental analysis. Don't forget to DM me on Twitter if you want to get the steps. I'll send you the PDF file. But before Skechers would make it to a whiteboard, I need to know what's new about the company that's going to bring institutional capital in. When I just look at the chart, there's nothing there that would get me excited. Michelle. Um, I just bought my dad a pair of arch support. He loves them. Okay. So Michelle is saying, Stephen, that maybe Skechers has a new product and it's going to bring people in. We'll see. Uh, what happened to gold and silver? Well, I went over that. I think if you got another question for me, you can ask, you can ask me, but, um, when you say what happened to it, you know, what happened to it is this, they got destroyed. And of course, you know, we, we have not owned precious metals for the majority of that decline. We've made money at the arm report in precious metals over the last couple of years. You go back and look at our trades. We're making money in precious metals. We buy when they're cheap. We sell into the strength. You know, it's like the first thing I've taught my son. He'll come in here and tell you, what's the first thing? I'll say, son, what's the first thing you do if you're investing in stocks? He's going to say to me, you, you know, buy weakness and you sell strength. I said, that's right. All right. So um, the U.S. dollar has skyrocketed and that just put you know, gold and silver investments on ice, along with other commodities that have imploded, right? It's not just gold and silver, copper, you know, all kinds of commodities imploded. So nothing more to, to say there. Um, yes, she is related to me. That's my sister. Oh, there she goes. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, what do we got? Family support. Yeah, absolutely. Family's in the game. Always has been. <laughs> yeah, Jay, way too much fun in college, brother. <laughs> but I like to say that without some of that valuable experience, I wouldn't understand the cannabis space at all. <laughs> all right. Um, boy, my mom just cringed at that comment. Sorry, mom. Sorry, honey. <laughs> all right. C E L H. Um, oh yeah. CELH. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Sean, look at the, um, I'm going to take this off the screen so you guys can see it a bit better. I'm going to blow it up. So here's your blowout earnings numbers, 800%, 650%, just total. And only a few quarters ago it was down, you know, 50%. So it's starting to blow out revenue 192, 167, just total revenue blowout. So it tells you something exciting is going on in the company. All right. Now we'd have to dive in and figure out you know, um, how sustainable that is. Is it just a fad? You know, is it just a fad, um, Sean, or is there something more there that, you know, that makes it something that would, that would end up on my whiteboard? Um, that chart pattern alone doesn't get there for me at the moment. So not doing that, but, um, I know I can see Emma, uh, monster and, um, Celsius are both looking pretty strong from a relative strength point of view, right? So the relative strength in the nineties. Um, but look at what's going on at monster. So that's kind of interesting. Monster negative 7% growth, only 22% revenue growth. So if you force me to buy one, I'd say you'd be buying CELH. That's the, that's the, the stock, the company, the product that's on the ascent. And I would say monster, uh, probably is in trouble. If anything, maybe monster is going to buy CELH. You know what I'm saying to infuse into their, um, product uh, portfolio, uh, some new growth potential. You know, I'm just spitballing here. I have no idea. But uh, that's how I'd look at those two companies. <laughs> hey, there you go, Deb. Tech Monkey Deb, that was for you. Anybody who has a topic they'd like for me to discuss, Deb answered the call last week with this question about fundamental analysis that I hope um, 
you enjoyed the answer to, Deb. Anybody who's got a question, put it in the comments section down here of what you'd like uh, to be addressed. And if I think I can add value, I'm happy to make it an armor education piece on the Week in Review. So nice to see you, Deb. And, and quite frankly, Deb, I'm really happy you made me do it because it it reminds me of the process and and helps me focus, you know, makes me do it. Oh, good. Love the new updates. I appreciate that. All right. Um, <laughs> I don't know what company that was. I didn't say they were trash, but all right. Uh, Ukraine wheat deal in trouble. How should that affect the price of wheat? I mean, there's the price of wheat just completely falling off of a cliff. And so, Stephen, I, I would say to you that I can't answer that question. You can't answer that question. Nobody can answer that question. And therefore, it cannot be an investment in my portfolio. So we're a macro fund. We look at macro things. You know, there's a trend in warfare towards drones. That's pretty obvious. That's a trend I can see. Trying to figure out the insanity of 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 what's going on in Eastern Europe right now and then making an investment is is a complete and utter roll of the dice that I'm not willing to take. If I'm going to roll the dice on anything, you know, I'm going to do this. Okay? Here's my dice roll. I'm going to buy MSOS. All right? Here's the thesis behind it. Ready? This is an easy one. Democrats are going to get obliterated in November if they continue on the path that they're on. One easy way to get votes is to be able to stand up there and say, I just passed a great bill to, you know, totally change the marijuana industry, to expunge records so all the people coming out of prison vote for me. I mean, it's a no-brainer, right? You know, um, one of the silver linings in a terrible recession and skyrocketing unemployment, which has not happened yet. But as a cannabis investor, while I will feel terrible for the people out of a job, as a cannabis investor, you want to see skyrocketing unemployment. Because th that there's no whip that snaps louder in the ears of a politician than skyrocketing unemployment. And the simplest salve, the bomb to put on it is to make cannabis legal, right? I mean, create huge amounts of jobs. We already see that happen on a state-by-state -state basis. Increase tax revenue. It's a no-brainer. So if you want me to take some type of gamble, Stephen, it's not going to be on wheat. It's going to be on the crop, though, and it's going to be on the cannabis crop. And so what I've started to do, shh, keep this down the download, don't tell anybody. <laughs> I'm starting to buy some calls on MSOS. Just some lottery tickets, money I don't mind losing, but I want to have something there. I probably don't need to because it's not going to be like there's a bill that gets passed overnight. It's going to be clear that there's a vote coming. So I could probably wait, but I, I just have a little piece out there because I have this sneaky suspicion uh, that politicians know what's about to happen and they start buying assets in front of the news because they have the inside information, which is illegal for the rest of us, but legal for them. And so my theory is you're going to start to see MSOS creep higher before any bill is passed. And so I want to have a position on Uh, is it a bad idea to short oil stocks? Uh, I, I wouldn't short oil stocks right now. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, come back to me, Jay, with that question on a future video. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be shorting. I wouldn't be shorting oil stocks. I wouldn't, and I wouldn't go long oil stocks yet either. Um, Do you see the future on a hydro, hydroponic stocks for growing food? 
That's a great idea. Give me an give me a hydroponic stock. Throw it out there. What's the symbol? Um, you know, should be a good idea. I mean, at one point, wasn't Village Farms involved in that? I mean, wasn't Village Farms the play for that? I don't know. I don't know, Deb. You know, put that on the whiteboard as a thought. Find the stock that you think is worthwhile. And let's go through the seven steps of fundamental investing. You know what I'm saying? Let me know what the stocks are. Um, we'll go through the seven steps. We'll look at the quarterly earnings and revenue. We'll look at the management team. We'll see if there's any institutional sponsorship. That's a situation, Deb, where institutional sponsorship could really help you. Your idea could be great, but if there's no institutions in the stocks you're looking at, you're probably way, way, way out in front of the crowd. And being out in front of the crowd is as bad as being behind the crowd. I mean, honestly, as an investor, you know, so um, was thinking of uh, uh, buying August by puts. What are your thoughts on that? I'm not a buyer of um, uh, first. OK, two thoughts on that, Jay. Uh, I, you're asking my opinion. So this is how I run money. Do your own thing. Right. All those disclaimers. Figure out where you are on the spectrum of risk management. Um, number one, I don't ever, if I think the S&P is going down, I would rather be short NASDAQ 100 and the small cap index. That's my opinion. So when I'm day trading, when I'm swing trading indexes, I'm long the S&P and I'm short the Qs and the small caps. Okay. The reason being that if the S&P is going down, the Qs and the small caps are going to go down more and they're just as liquid. So I'd rather be there. So that's my, that's my one thought. Um, I also like if I'm short Qs and small caps, I might get long the S and P intraday intraday to hedge it. That's another thing. Okay. But, um, I wouldn't, I'm not going to hold shorts overnight. I'm not going to buy puts on indexes overnight unless I see the S and P and the other indexes trading back up towards this may fed day low, which is also the downtrend of the big channel and the 200 day moving average. If we get up there and here's the NASDAQ, right? So up here, if we get up here and the market rolls over and very often it'll spike above and then reverse and come back down. And that would be a no brainer setup to me. If it spiked above and then had a reversal down, you know, type of three bar, two or three bar candlestick reversal. Bang. I put puts in the portfolio. I will do that. I'm looking to do that if I get the opportunity. Otherwise I'm just day trading from the short side. Okay. And we made a lot of money day trading from the short side, uh, yesterday. Okay. Here, I'll give you, um, um, maybe it's easier to see. This is our day trading screen that we use Jay. And so I, I took everybody through a step-by-step -step process. I'll just blow this up. And this is um, an example of what's on our day trading uh, playbook on the website. So um, if you want to see this type of a pattern, and what I do here, Jay, is I give step-by-step -step, uh, analysis of how we day trade. So the day trading playbook for Armor Insiders, and I update it every week, of how we capture these things step by step. And so eventually over time, you'll be able to do it yourself. You'll look at the day trading playbook and say, Oh, this is the trade that's showing up. How do I trade it? And so what we did on Friday in the, in the NASDAQ 100 is we had this perfect reversal bar. So the market opened flat and I break down the index trading into three categories. One is a flat open. One's a gap up open. One's a gap down open. We have plays designed for each type of open, all right? So the opening play of a flat open is we stay out of it and wait for the reaction. The reaction in this case was a rally reversal implosion. That's number one. We don't short right away, okay, because it gets out of hand. We wait for the test at the VWAP. That's number two. It makes a double top at the VWAP. We get short at number three as it double top is a failure. We ride it down to number four and book partial profits at the ATR low of the day. And then we ride it all day until it closes above the first standard deviation below the VWAP. And we book the rest of our gains because the trade's over. Okay. We did the same exact thing on small caps. 
at the same time. And so I love, I like to say confluence is king on our desk. Okay. So the same setup occurred with slightly different formation, but the same setup on small caps. We were short this bar here, covered some right there, rode the rest and covered the rest uh, at, at number five. Okay. So um, if you find this information helpful, first of all, hit the like button, but also become a subscriber and you get access to step-by-step -step processes every day and you'll learn how to trade the indexes. Okay. Um, so right now, in order for me to get swing trading short or buy puts on the indexes, I need higher prices first. I need to see the market rip higher. Let's say the Fed announcement does whatever, and there's a relief rally, and it runs up and reverses. Then I'll buy puts. That's my theory. Any thoughts on the cannabis space? Roblox besties. <laughs> I love that. Um, I think I just answered that question, though, so I'm going to go on, okay? My thought on the cannabis space is that I would like to own um, MSOS in here. And I'm doing it through the options market just to get my toe in the water to make sure I have something and it'll, it'll, it'll earn me the right to take more risk when the asset really starts to move. I don't think cannabis moves until either A, the bear market's over or B, the march toward some type of safe banking, federal legality, something um, becomes really loud. And I don't know if that's going to happen right now or if it happens closer to November or it happens after November. I don't know. You know, we'll, we'll have to see, you know, I think we need to see honestly, some really ugly employment numbers. And, and then that's going to, I think, compel politicians to do it, but who knows? I mean, this is just a guess. What weed stocks do you like? Um, no interest in Canadian weed stocks. If I'm going to be buying the weed stocks, it's U S cannabis companies I have an interest in, you know, the top, the top four, I like MSOS. I think that's the best way to play it. I don't have to worry about one name or the other, and I don't have to buy things on the Canadian stock exchange, but you know, true leave green thumb. These are the best names. Um, and, and, uh, you know, if you twisted my arm, okay. Tell Ray, you know, tell Ray, sure. You know, take a fly, but I don't really, to me, the, the real value that's going to be unlocked when safe banking is passed is in the U S cannabis stocks. I mean, massive value. They trade on an exchange where most people can't buy them. You pass safe banking and they start uplisting to the new eyes, the, the new, the, the U S stock exchanges. These stocks should go to the moon. It won't even matter if it's federally legal. So that's where the, the juice is to me. Um, Oh, excellent. Joni, thanks for that. I appreciate it. Um, oh, yeah. V so I was right there. Yeah, VFF, um, Grogen. I, there's an example of uh, a management team that I just, you know, I, I, I said a long time ago that um, this, this company is run by the wrong people and I can't own the stock. And you can see, and I made a lot of money on the stock, right? We bought it at, what was it? Four, five, six bucks. And we sold it 18 to 22 dollars. And then the stock went to the moon. I didn't own it. And now it's imploded. And I didn't own it because the management team is a joke. Okay. I can't own it. Hey, Lena. Happy birthday. Hope you had a great week. Um, what do you think of chart? ZPS. Zodis. The chart isn't compelling to me, Lena, but we could talk about it on the desk together. And if you want... We could do some research on it next week on our virtual, uh, um, in our virtual conference room together, right? Um, develops animal medicines and vaccines for livestock. I mean, it, I, I, that, that chart doesn't, is not compelling to me. The earnings and revenue don't, don't have any compelling figures in them. So there'd have to be something new inside the company that you thought was coming down the pipe that would get me interested in that, in that idea. Right. H H Y F M. It's just too early for these names. Just too early. Thanks for that, Joni. I appreciate it. You're welcome guys. Hey, Eris, how are you, man? H F C L. 
I'm not getting a chart. I'm not getting a a, uh, a chart there. Nothing's coming up there. So maybe you got unless I'm doing H F C L. I don't have anything there. So uh, take a look at that symbol and get back to me, brother. Yeah, cure leaf. No, cure leaf. Um, any of those names, Deb, <coughs> any of those names, Cure Leaf, Green Thumb, any of the big names. But for my money, I'd just rather own MSOS. If I could start making money on the ETF, then I could earn the right to, to kind of branch out and get a little more risky and buy individual names. Right now, it's just a group story to me. I just want to own the group and I don't want individual stock risk. SG. Sweet green. Let's take a look. All right, we're going to wrap this up, guys. Any other questions, pop them in. If not, you can watch this later. You can always ask me a question in the comment section, and I'll get to it. Owns and operates 150 fast food joints. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I looked into this story. Well, you've got revenue ramping. Of course, they're losing money because this is a startup, so they're just trying to get things going. So I don't mind that there's NAs here in the earnings category. Oh, wait, you can't see that. Let me take this off. So down here, you're, you know, you've got some NAs because they're losing money as they're you know, building out their brand. But revenue is ramping at a pretty decent clip. I would have to do research on this before I could give you any information there. Um, uh, Jay, but th I mean, that, that chart pattern doesn't give me any, uh, reason to get excited. Yeah. So SMR is a huge winner and errors has been all over it. Well done, man. Just a fantastic call on that story. Uh, and I do think, um, small molecular, uh, reactors is the future. Okay. So I do think that SMR is the future. Small nuclear reactors is the future of nuclear energy. So that is the best place to be. Uh, and that stock has been unbelievable. So great call. Um, I don't think I have anything else to say about that at this time. Okay. I think nuclear you know, is something where we should see higher prices. And yet the whole nuclear, you know, group, you know, if you look at Sprott Uranium, there's nothing compelling about that chart. It's a rally off the low that looks like it's hitting resistance. I, you know, CCJ being the leader. And, and there's just nothing compelling about that chart right now. So it's pretty impressive. Ares is able to pick off, quite frankly, the one uranium stock that's going through the roof while everything else is kind of suffering. That's impressive. And that's the value of the virtual hedge fund desk because I wasn't on that name. And Ares, one of our original armor insiders and a very good friend, is a certified armor analyst. <laughs> well done, Ares. All right, guys, let's end on that note. I've had lots of fun with you. I appreciate all the time you spent with me. If you um, enjoyed this, don't forget to hit that like button on the way out. Uh, any comments you want to ask me, anything to think of later and you want me to go over, boom, just throw it in the comment section. Happy to do it. And I'll see you all. Um, I'll see you all uh, next week.